I'm not sure how we mix DNS attacks with the wild, wild west. Yeah, maybe it's because like in the wild, wild west, we are going through a land full of threats. Where good cowboys fall asleep and evil gunmen roam at ease. So we have known about the vulnerabilities surrounding DNS for years now. But little has been done to fix them. So DNS attack has become a means to get a bigger price. Uh, we have observed an increase of attacks and million has been lost. Uh, and invaluable information has been leaked. So we want this situation to change. We want the good cowboys to start fighting back. So we are going to show you who the gunmen are, how they like the whiskey, and how they use their guns. So we want you to understand the dimension of this kind of attack uh, with the deep consequences it has. And we want to show you uh, and to you to learn how to prevent them. How to protect yourselves, how to protect your secrets, and the secrets of the ones you love that don't have the means to protect themselves. But first, please let us introduce ourselves. I'm Valentina, and she's my teammate, Ruth. We both work at the Deloitte um, Threat Library team, a threat intelligence analyst. And today we are going to, to speak about, uh, first we're going to review the different type of DNS attack that we are going to go over. Then uh, we are going to view a list of uh, attacks of using DNS from 2007 until now. Um, this is based on uh, English public sources. I want to make this uh, clear because we know that there are some publications in other languages that we cannot uh, consult. Then we are going to see the APTs, which are the gunmen's, uh, and a little bit of the common techniques and uh, a little summary about this, these attacks. So what we do in our daily work is to research about threat groups' activities, including campaigns, malware, and the tools that they use. And for doing this, uh, we adapted the use of MITRE attack framework because that allowed us to better communicate with other teams about uh, the group activities. And doing this for almost three years now, and focusing not only on current events, but also in past events, ha has allowed us to observe how DNS protocol is being abused for cover infection, communication, exfiltration, and also strategic compromise. So just for sake, everyone is on the same page. We are not going to dig really deep in how the DNS works because of reasonable time. But um, for those that don't know how DNS works, it's basically a mean to translate the domain into an IP address where you can access the information. So it works a little bit like a phone agenda where you ask for the, the name and you have the number. So this is the process that actually goes until you can actually get into your, the domain you're consulting. So the kind of attacks we're going to review are the DNS tunneling, DNS hijacking, and the DNS poisoning. Or as we call here, the bullets. So. Uh, regarding DNS tunneling, um, DNS tunneling is a way of inbound and outbound communication through an under-monitored protocol. Um, it's used basically, basically to exfiltrate data through DNS queries. So in this example, you can see uh, the threat actor is encoding some information in the, uh, using Big64. Could have choose uh, any other way, but for the sake of this example, we choose Big64. And it will uh, launch the query through the recursive DNS server, to, through the firewall, through the internet, until it reaches the domain, um, the attacker server, uh, or the C2 command and control. And also, the attacker can send the same, uh, the same query with uh, some information back that could end up being executed by the malware in the victim machine. We have also a simplified example of DNS hijacking. In this example, the hacker has a way to modify the DNS settings, let's say that they, they compromise the, the owner or something like that. And so the user is trying to access to one of these sites that are modified, and it's going to be redirected to a malicious website instead of a legitimate one. And we have also a simplified example of DNS poisoning on which the user tries to access to one of, uh, let's say, unpopular sites. So the site is not in the DNS server cache. So the DNS, DNS server cache is going to ask the root authoritative DNS for the record and to know uh, what is the real IP for that domain. And the hacker is going to introduce a rogue, rec a rogue DNS record uh, before the, the root authoritative DNS answers. So this uh, record is going to be added to the cache and the user is going to be redirected to this malicious website instead of the legitimate one. So, well, now we are going to go to dig deep into the attacks. I want you to notice that there are two kinds of figures in the, in the screen. You can see the rounded ones. Those are malware pieces that had been used. And for the other part, the, the square ones are campaigns launched. 
The first case we chose to start this presentation is the Julia Romero case. This case got a lot of international attention because um, there was a little piece of malware called Net that, DNS, uh, that hijacked the DNS computer, um, sorry, the DNS local in the computer, and it will start uh, showing the attackers advertising. So that happened to a teacher in a classroom and the, it, the computer of the teacher started popping like adult content to the students and she got convicted for like 40 years. Then her, her case was reviewed and everything, but that, the absurdity of the case got uh, a lot of attention internationally. And then the next, oh, sorry. Uh, the next case that we are going to review a little bit, uh, so uh, for to speak, is the um, go, uh, Operation Gosclick. Operation Gosclick was an operation carried out by the FBI uh, that was called the biggest cyber, cyber criminal takedown in history at the time. Um, the malware involved, oh, sorry, the malware involved as DNS changer. Um, DNS changer was uh, like, kind of sure you remember a time where you go to a streaming website and you will have a pop-out telling you that you needed to download a, a something to see the video. So that's how this malware work and it will hijack your, comput your computer. So around four million people were affected by this and um, six Estonian went down for this fraud and they earn around $14 million through click hijacking techniques. But we did not only observe uh, attacks that are made for financial purposes, but also to make statements. So for example, we have statements that are made just for fun, as in the case of Craigslist, that it was hijacked, and the users were being redirected to a prank site. Or also, sometimes they are made uh, for the fame, as in the case of the Romanian top-level domain that was also hijacked, and popular sites were redirected to a hacker's control server, and seeming like a defacement for, just for the fame. Uh, sometimes the statements are made for political reasons, just as the Iranian cyber army and Syrian electronic army. Um, but talking about DNS abuse victims, we have to talk uh, about Brazil because they have uh, been experiencing this kind of attack since at least 2011. So for, th for this kind of attacks, they use DNS poisoning at the ISP level. Sometimes they compromise a, a home and, co and organization routers through uh, weak passwords and also used a firmware vulnerability to all to drop a bank intrusion. But in the last few years, we also observed attacks that we were uh, being carried via phishing. So using social engineering trickery and web-based attacks, they uh, changed the DNS settings and they redirect uh, users to malicious domains. Uh, but the doing this via phishing uh, not only allowed us uh, allowed her, uh, the actors to to attack Brazil, but also expanded to the United States and China. And speaking about China, we have to talk about the first cases of uh, DNS spoofing uh, carried by a national state. So you all probably know what is the Great Firewall, which is the means that China has to uh, uh, avoid uh, the, youth, the citizens to accessing to censored sites. So, like my teammate said, um, the, around 2002, the Chinese government started redirecting users to blocked IP addresses when they tried to access some um, censor pages. So, this was pretty easy to predict for the circumvention tools. Around 2015, they started redirecting users to legitimate websites. This ended up being a way of carrying out um, denial of service attacks through some of the websites that were against uh, this kind of um, behavior. For example, one of the main af affected by this, this uh, attack was Great, Great Fire, which is an NGO that works to help citizens of China to bypass the Great Firewall. GitHub was also affected um, an, a French NGO regarding freedom of speech and so web pages in South Korea. Now we are moving to the last three years, uh, from since 2016 until now, and this is um, this is in this uh, stage we are going to see a, a much more targeted kind of attack. So the first red actor we are going to review is called Ori. So Ori is a suspected Iranian red actor and is considered to be an expert because they build their own tools and uh, has a way to being uh, undetected for a long period of time. They are usually motivated by political and military reasons and also for financial gain. 
Uh, what is interesting about this uh, thread actor is that they have exclusive malware, uh, malware pieces that all use DNS uh, as a main channel or also as a fallback channel. So they usually send uh, this, uh, this malware via spear phishing uh, as an attachment and also they, they have uh, this um, encoding, uh, usually they use base 36 and base 64 for uh, filtrating the information. So I, as Ruth said, we see here uh, all the tools that already uses for, uh, with that has DNS channeling as a means of communication. Uh, the, the, the record that I'll use mostly is the A record and the 4A record. This is the APV4 and this one is the APV6 record. Uh, the encoding in the last tools is more, is uh, big 64 and what is interesting is that they will use this channel to execute code to to send like a query with information to execute the code and some of the pieces will um, treat the 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 ip6 record as exa data and it will end up downloading downloading another piece of malware The next thread actor we are going to go over, it's called, it's Project Sauron. Project Sauron uh, was detected by Kaspersky around 2015. And it's really, it's a really complex thread actor and it's suspected to be to, of United States origin. Although obviously this is not confirmed and um, some sources in the United States deny it. Um, we wanted to show how a really, really complex thread actor like this one uh, also chose to use DNS tunnel as a mean to exfiltrate some data. Uh, since DNS uh, exfiltration could be kind of noisy because you are going to make a lot of requests to the same domain and through a, mostly the same record, this will be kind of easy to detect. And this campaign was designed to remain uh, undetected for a long period of time. So instead of doing uh, exfiltration of every uh, everything through DNS, they only use it to exfiltrate real-time status inform information of the campaign, and also to exfiltrate some system metadata. Uh, this is a little chart uh, using MITRE. Uh, it's from uh, Project Sauron. Uh, this is what I told you about that, how he's a, it's a really complex thread actor. We wanted to show you that. It's not color-coded, so it's mostly so you can distinguish uh, the tactics uh, easily. But we have also observed other uh, thread actors using uh, these kind of uh, attacks. So we have Dark Hydrus, which, which was uh, first discovered and uh, disclosed on July 2018 by Palo Alto. So this thread group uh, uses a malware that is called Rock Robin that was first uh, uh, it was first based on PowerShell and now it's an executable, but they use DNS tunneling for, for also for communication and now they added the use of uh, Google as a fallback channel. Uh, sorry, the Google API. So uh, this reactor is pretty interesting. Uh, it's also, also suspected to be Iranian and also considered to be an expert. And they are uh, motivated by military and political advantage. So the interesting thing about Rock Robin is that they have a hard-coded list of DNS record types, and it's going to try to reach to the command and control with each one of them. And the one that answers quickly is the one that is going to be used for bidirectional communication with the Trojan. But we have also observed DNS tunneling uh, using in, being used in point of sale malware. So since 2015, we observed Bernard Post, uh, which was one of the first uh, reported malware that use, uh, uses DNS tunneling for exfiltration of the data. So it, this is uh, something that is started to being used in a lot of other point of sale malware because it's really uh, it makes sense because if you think about uh, how is a great card, the information of the great card is there are little chunks of data such as the great card ID, the the expiry date, so that all all that data perfectly fits as a subdomain for the attacker to exfiltrate the information uh, and be uh, the, being undetected. And the last latest ones of the point of sale malware that is using this also added some uh, techniques to uh, being under, undercover and they mimic to be a legitimate software and sometimes they avoid to infect victims that are there for no use for them. So now we're going to go a little bit over FIN7. FIN7 is a financially motivated threat actor. For those that are not familiar with it, uh, all the FIN actors are financially motivated. Uh, this one is uh, suspected to be Eastern European, uh, probably Russian, but 
is not, uh, is not for sure. Um, as I say, the main reason behind this attack is to get some kind of economic advantage. What is interesting about this tool is that it's based on a public tool available on GitHub. It's called the NSDXT Pwnage. Um, so you can check it out. Uh, they use an office get a version of it. Um, there has another interesting thing that's the only tool that we have seen that switches records between a record and txt record in order to disguise the tunneling communication. And it also has a way of randomizing the domain to which it's going to make uh, the request. So it's kind of salty. And then we have APT32, also known as Ocean Lotus. It's Ocean Lotus is suspected to be a Vietnamese APT. Um, the main target for this, uh, it's for this red actor are companies inside Vietnam that have some kind of interest in, in economic interest in, in Vietnam. They also target uh, other so 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 Asian so Eastern Asian governments, um, journalists, and members of the Vietnamese diaspora. They have a really complex uh, attack workflow uh, with uh, several stages. But one of the stages, of the first one, is the, the use of Dennis Bagder. Sometimes they choose to use this tool that also communicates through DNS tunneling. And an interesting thing about this tool is that the last uh, version of it will it had a, added a fallback channel to HTTP just in case the DNS tunnel communication won't work. And now we are moving to what is, uh, in our uh, thing, the, the most interesting part of the, of the talk, which is the last, uh, the last attacks and the US third alert that was in January this year. So um, we are going to talk about DNS Spionage and Sea Turtle. These are the last campaign discovered regarding DNS tunneling that led to uh, a new US alert uh, in January this year. DNS was hijacking in a global level. So first, uh, Cisco discovered DNS espionage around November 2018. And uh, this was a threat actor that affected mostly Lebanon and the United Arab Emirates, suspected to be from Iranian origin. And they have two tools. One is called DNS espionage of the, uh, of the threat actor himself, and the other one is called Karkarov. And the main difference between the two is that after the Cisco report in Karkarov, they added some uh, anti-sandboxing techniques to make, uh, to, and to make it different, difficult for the analysts to, to study the tool. Um, what is interesting about this is that uh, also uh, uh, an additional, based on the US Earth, uh, FireEye in January 2019 uh, published it about DNS redirection attacks uh, because they were a big increase of, on this. So they observed uh, DNSA records being abused uh, via DNS providers admin panel and also using DNS name server records uh, by compromised register or country code top level domains, which is a huge thing. And based on the amount of uh, victims and their regions that they affect, which is Middle East, North Africa, Europe, and North America, they assess that there are more than one threat actor probably behind it. And they, they are probably uh, have uh, big capabilities. And so now we move to C Turtle, which I call like the Project Sauron of DNS hijacking, because uh, it's suspected uh, to be a nation state, but it's not clear which state is behind it. And the thing is that it affected a lot of countries, uh, mostly in Middle East. Uh, if the list of countries will be Albania, Cyprus, Turkey, Lebanon, Armenia, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, and the United Arab Emirates, and the case of uh, Armenia is pretty huge since. All the, rec all the domains that were from the top level domain of Armenia were hijacked. Um, the, the thing about this is that they target mostly, well, they were after uh, ministers of foreign affairs, military organizations, in intelligence agencies also, and also some energy organizations. Um, but they will first compromise us, our registry, our registrar, or a service provider for them, like, um, you know, maybe, some, um, some um, tele ISP provider, some telecommunication companies, um, some uh, technical company. Um, through those uh, compromised credentials, they will modify the, uh, the, DNS, the DNS records 
uh, to redirect the traffic to a threat actor control named Saber, and it's believed that the attack, the means behind these attacks was to harvest more credentials for a second stage attack. So now that we have bombed you all with <laughs> all of this information, we are going to see a little bit about the common things between all these attacks. So for example, in DNS hijacking, we observe that the initial access techniques that they usually use is brute force because they have, a, let's say, a dictionary of weak passport or default passport that are going to attempt to, uh, for modifying the, the configuration of the DNS. Uh, we have also observed attacks that uh, abuse the trusted relationship, for example, in the case of the Brazilian ISP that was DNS poisoned. So the victims were not in, in, uh, in itself uh, victims of the malware or, or the modifications, but the ISP server was. And also we observe other attacks that use valid accounts to modify the DNS records uh, in the DNS register. So this way they, they do a DNS hijacking into the, the, the domain. But we have also observed some Sorry. interesting DNS tunneling uh, techniques. Sorry. Sorry, yeah, I, I, <laughs> we uncurling yourself, yeah. Uh, well, regarding DNS tunneling common techniques, we have, shown, we have seen that 78% of the attacks have uh, a spear phishing attachment of their in initial vector. Then we have seen that 50% of the tools that use th this kind of uh, communication use uh, scheduled tasks to establish persistence. 40% of them will treat, uh, will use PowerShell to execute the commands that, that the um, attacker will, will send through uh, DNS queries. And finally, 36% of them is, had a fallback channel. Could be that DNS was the main channel and had a fallback channel in HTTP, HTTPS, or other, other communication method. Or it could be that DNS was a fallback channel for one of the, the, those communication methods. And regarding DNS records, we have seen then uh, they have a clear preference for the A record, which is the IP, uh, IPv4 record, uh, followed by the IPvC record. And the encoding they prefer to use is the base 64. Some of the, uh, some of the um, uh, threat actors will sanitize this encoding to make it domain safe. And when the threat actors send back an IP address um, as a response, this IP will be treated as binary or as ASCII. And even in the case of we mentioned before of Volrig, it will be treated as X set decimal um, character and it will be used to download some uh, additional tool. So we have also some general recommendations for you to touch these bullets. So for example, like the general thing is to uh, activate multi-factor authentication on domains admin portal. Oh, also you, you use Unix password and password managers. And we have some um, recommendations for DNS hijacking case. Yeah, for DNS hijacking, you, you should use secure DNS. There are multiple solutions that try to add sec security to DNS that wasn't think uh, on security when it was designed, such as DNSSEC or DNS script. And also you should be validating that your A records and the NS records are pointing to the right directions. But we have also uh, some recommendations for detecting DNS tunneling or blocking it. So for example, if your organization doesn't use uh, the, the TXT annual records, you should block them. And you can block pa packages uh, according to their size. But well, I think you all now understand what we are trying to say to all of you, that you all should be monitoring your DNS traffic. So this is kind of all from our part. We hope now you, this presentation helped the good cowboys to awake and start fighting back. We hope you better understand how this kind of attack works, uh, how uh, millions of dollars are being lost, and how invaluable information is being leaked. Um, now we want you to start fight fighting back, but most of all, we want you to, to start, start monitoring, monitoring your, your DNS, DNS traffic. traffic. Thank you. So is there, if anyone have any question, I'm going to leave the mic right here. Hello. Which kind of source do you have used to identify that uh, the um, macro has been used at the first level of, of um, infection for the execution of the payload for the first stat that you have mentioned into your slides? Which kind of uh, which kind of, from which source do you have used it from uh, antivirus, common and control, uh, internal system? Which uh, from which uh, source do you extract this kind of information? Okay. You are you are asking us for the sources of the information. Well. Uh, 
And how do you have detected that, uh, that the first execution of the payload was raised by, by an, uh, a macro, in fact? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get the last part. <laughs> in fact, my question is, uh, how do you have uh, detected that um, the first level of infection was, uh, was used by uh, using a macro, in fact, and not... Uh, okay, the, so the initial access. Yes. You mean? Well, we kind of use like a bunch of sources. So I'm going to show you how many so you can uh, see. This will be available on the website uh, of the, I mean, the, this, I uh, think they're going to be online. So you can consult all the sources yourself. Uh, we basically made a study of each of the cases we, re uh, we had and we started to, <laughs> I think that's it. I think this one is the last one. Yeah. So we started to reviewing and, and analyzing which was the initial vector for each of them. And we also used some Deloitte internal resources. We cannot share that information with you because it's confidential. So we only mm, put the, the public sources and the bibliography. Um, any other question? I'm surprised there's no question about the attribution. <laughs> Okay, so if that's it, I want to thank you all and also thank OWATS for having us here.